You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast, brought to you by Apex Race Manager. Choose your race strategy, optimize your car, and race to win the championship. Today's episode is called Boom Shakalaka Vamos. I'm your host, Richard Spanners Ready, and I'm joined by Matt to Rumpets. How's it going, Matt? Ah, oh, it's going great. We had a race today. How could it not be going great? It was really good. And as soon as the rain started to fall, I said to my wife, not only am I going to watch the race now, I will be putting headphones in and I do not want to be disturbed because this is going to be cracking. My boy sat down next to me and what we saw next was just unbelievable. But Matt, we predicted a Ferrari dominated weekend. But in the end, I feel they lacked race pace. Well, maybe they did and maybe they didn't. But personally, I was utterly stonkered at Mercedes' amazing strategy move of having Ferrari Barcelona themselves. I mean, it was brilliant <laughs> stuff from their chief strategist. Certainly a bold tactic to have two mediocre starts from their drivers as well to avoid all the chaos. Indeed. Although you have to hand it to Kimi Raikkonen. Nobody saw him starting and getting ahead of Verstappen in that kind of weather. Are you going to say the race was ruined by Kimi showing an unexpected and startling return to form? Well, you know, I mean, let's face it. What has he mostly done? Every now and then in Q3, maybe he uh, looks like he's going to win, and then he drives over a curb or loses control of his car, finishes fourth, fifth, winds up being a strategy move for Ferrari. And then just today, he's like, I'm going to start like I'm 19. Today, I'm going to turn up. But look, let me assure some people who are a bit concerned and the people who don't like my militant ham stance, I am not in smug celebration mode today. Honestly, I'm not. Because actually, I'm, I'm still just a little stunned. I didn't even cheer or celebrate anything when, you know, when it all kicked off at turn one, Matt. I was just staring at the screen in amazement as uh, at what I was seeing. And I think much like when your opponent fouls on the black in pool or snooker, you just nod politely, acknowledge your luck, and chalk one up on the scoreboard. We are an independent Formula One podcast hosted on the website, mistapexpodcast.com. We aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. This show is safe for work. We're keeping it clean here, so you can play this with kids in the background or at work. We are joined today by Chris Rainbow Sparkle Stevens. How's it going, Chris? Hey, it's going good, man. How's it going for you? I'm having a great time. Not smug at all. Alex Van Jean, how are you doing, buddy? Surprisingly, I've had a really, really good day. Hooray. Yesterday sucked, but today is great. Yeah, it was a sharp turnaround. I lost all hope on Saturday, and we all we all looked to the heavens for miracles, and it came in the form of H2O from the sky. And we have a chat room host today. We have... Darren Johnson, a.k.a. Lakes Boy, in the Slack group. Thank you for helping us today. No problem at all. My pleasure. Be sure to differentiate when it's your hardened northern opinion and when it is the chat rooms. Well, this this little thing here is Rocket Reds. This is a McLaren shirt, so they'll be McLaren skewed if they're my opinions. All right, then. And a big hello to the live stream as well. They have found us by going to Missed Apex Podcast on YouTube and clicking subscribe. If you then click the little bell, you'll get a notification every time we go live, which is generally at 8pm British time on a Sunday. Matt, the dominoes started to fall. We thought silly season had started early for the drivers, but also the engines kind of caught up with us very quickly. There was no news, no news, rumour, rumour, all the news. Yeah. And what's highly entertaining about it is exactly what happened is exactly what everybody has been saying was going to happen just without quite enough sourcing. And sure enough, it was Splitsville for the uh, one time uh, wonder duo of McLaren and Honda and immediately then again for Renault. And then Sainz was off to his new team and poor Jolian Palmer just got left out in the cold. Yeah, he did. Do you want want to talk about Jolian Palmer first? Because I think that he has been treated very, very unfairly, Jeansy, because his crime, as far as I can figure out, is not being a top-rated, fast Formula One driver. As far as I know, he doesn't go around punching babies, and unless he's a secret baby puncher and we don't know about it, I think Renault have just treated him with a complete lack of respect over his contract. 
Well, we've been hearing more and more about this and the fact that he hasn't had the set, apart from on two occasions, he hasn't had the um, same car as Hulk for most of the season. And the two times that he did on one of those occasions, he outqualified Hulk and then his gearbox died. He hasn't been treated well, but he hasn't done himself any favours. He's crashed in too many practice sessions. Um, he's been slow and off the pace in races. Um, and has he done enough to deserve another drive? I don't know. But has he been treated right? Probably not. Well, it's not just the fact he's not getting another drive, is it, Chris? It's the fact that he found out on Autosport and, you know, Summers was saying, does he really need telling that he's not got a contract for next year? But it would have been polite to at least have told him before going to the press. No, exactly. Obviously, no one's taken him aside uh, and and uh, told him formally, oh, by the way, we won't be needing your services next season. And I've got to agree with Alex. It's the worst way you could possibly treat a driver. Unless he's a baby puncher. I want to make that clear. I do condemn the punching of all babies. And if he's secretly doing that, then I, I'm next in line after Renault. Uh, Matt, what else did we see before? In fact, engines, wasn't it? That was the big announcement. Uh, McLaren off, are off the hook. Toro Rosso are boned. And I think Red Bull as well have been uh, trying to find a polite word for shafted. Shafted is probably OK uh, by Renault, by them finally saying, do you know what? We don't need you. Goodbye. Well, you know, I think it's maybe a little too early to decide who is going to be shafted by what exactly. Um, and it did lead to possibly my favorite comment of the entire race weekend uh, during qualifying when they asked uh, Ricardo if he'd heard about rumors that Renault wanted him. He's like, no, but I'm not surprised. I'm fast and good looking, <laughs> which was brilliant. But I don't know. Uh, a lot of people look at the first two years of Honda's tenure and and think they've been at it for three years and made no progress. But this year is its own thing. They made a lot of progress. They're on target for Mexico. I think Renault v. Honda next year is going to be the interesting thing to watch, personally. Okay, so Hannah's really uh, hopeful that McLaren Honda is over. Well, she says McLaren Honda is over. Praise the Lord Almighty. You must feel uh, the same, Lakes Boy, as well, being a McLaren fan. I don't actually. I, I'm actually with Matt in that it's it, it, the engine's bad, but the Renault ain't much better. Some good. There's yeah, militant home force underestimate understatement of the week. Dominic <laughs> Burns saying, "Cheers, Dominic. Um, yeah. Glad you made it." Okay, excellent. Okay then, uh, Matt. Uh, engine stuff kind of mostly aside then into qualifying. We knew it was going to be hard going for the Mercedes boys and I think everyone was in that kind of dam damage limitation mode. But really, all through Friday and Saturday, we thought Red Bull, like we suggested after we spoke to Peter when we previewed Singapore, we thought Red Bull might come in and kind of save Mercedes blushes a bit by being up front and reducing the gap. But no, Sebastian Vettel up front, absolute worst case scenario for Hamfosi, worst case scenario for Mercedes, and, and utterly unexpected. Where on earth did that come from? I don't really know, because they were absolutely nowhere on Friday. They did not look good. The car didn't look great. And, and Vettel didn't even get a decent lap in. In fact, I've been sort of tracking the progress from uh, free practice three to qualifying. And, and looking at the times, even if I adjusted Ferrari time, to, to be similar to what Hamilton ran on Friday. Hamilton should have been able to run a faster lap than Vettel did based on their average improvement uh, per track. I was very surprised by that. Maybe you'd ask the question, where was Giovinazzi Friday night? Because that's the only thing I can come up with. That he was pulling a late shift in the simulator. Indeed. Hasn't that kind of been the story of the season so far, though? Ferrari have done poorly on a Friday and then all of a sudden pulled it out the bag and been much, much closer on a Saturday. That seems to be the way it has been. I mean, you talk about Vettel's lap and where it came from. You could see him winding that lap up. Um, he never actually got a perfect solid lap in through Q1 or Q2. And you could just see him slowly winding it up. And then there was that lap at the very end of Q2 where he bailed going over the start finish line completely came off the throttle and was about 30 kilometers an hour down and was still only just off Verstappen's time. So that's when we knew that that time that he did was there. All right, then. Well, moving on from qualifying, let's move on to the race. And we get to start, I think, this week's game of whose fault is this nice and early. I think we should change it up, Matt, because it's the only one and it is very, very much the talking point of this race. So let's stop dawdling and find out. 
Whose fault is it? All right, look, it was uh, an amazing start. Uh, it was one of those starts that will go down in history. This is Spa 1998. This is Spain 2016. It was absolutely stunning, Matt. And I think, as you alluded to, all caused by a great start by Kimi Raikkonen. Uh, was it his fault? No, we're not going to do it in that children's style, but it was a great start by Kimi Raikkonen. It was. It was spectacular. And you, like I said, you, just not what you'd expect, given the fact that it was raining in Singapore the first time that had ever happened. And yet there he was, basically past Verstappen, who had no bad start himself, well before they arrived at the apex for turn one. See, I actually think that both Seb and Max bogged down a little bit because Kimi didn't get as a, better, a much better start than the guys directly behind him. So I think it was more the two guys in the front row got poor starts. But what was interesting was, um, if any of you watched the Sky coverage and watched the um, trap parade, and Lewis gate crashed Sebastian Vettel's interview and then had the interviewer come in the car with him. And he was all, for someone starting fifth, sixth, <laughs> where he started in the end, um, and usually when Lewis is in that kind of position, he's, a bit down and a bit quiet he was really jumped up and hyping and then as soon as the rain came down it was uh all interesting but i don't think it's a case of whose fault is it i think it's a case of whose fault wasn't it and the fact that ferrari came out there and tried to blame max is just ludicrous max started kept the steering wheel straight and got hit from both sides can't be max's fault ferrari are completely out of it um I think he just got pincered by the pair of them. I think it's both their faults. Well, to be fair, in, in, in previous situations like that, we, we've seen it suggested that perhaps brakes could be used to avoid these sorts of things. Why should he brake? It's going in a straight line off the start, nowhere near a braking point. Are you suggesting that Verstappen could have braked? Because I think he did. I think he said he did get on the brakes, just not quickly enough. Yeah, but I mean, we, we've seen these pincers before, and, and it always comes down to, at a certain point, somebody says, well... Why didn't you step on the brakes? Why not get off the gas? Now, uh, Chris is normally the first one to jump in and go, uh, No, I think you'll find in this situation it was a racing incident. There's no real blame to be had, as much as we tell him we don't acknowledge so-called racing incidents here. That's because you're a man who loves to argue um, spanners. It's, um, not, it's not my fault. I, it's the environment I live in. Blame my I'm terrible a, wife. A Jedi. <laughs> I'm like a Jedi. I have peace, serenity... Um, but uh, no, in this instance, I will uh, fully put blame on the two Ferraris. I don't know what they um, attempted to achieve. You certainly cannot put any blame on Max and anybody that has been really needs to go and rewatch that because it, you, there's just no way you can possibly um, do that. And I, I, it was so unnecessary. It was so un and you know people were saying, "Oh wow, what a great start to the Grand Prix." I hated it. We were denied a massive five car scrap for the win. And what we ended up with was a fifth of the field being eliminated after 20 seconds. And I disagree. Where else are you going to see a single contact result in that many people being taken out of the race, including Alonzo, which, oh, man, talk about bad timing and luck. Why is that a good thing? By the way, amazing start from Alonzo. How he managed to find any grip on that paint on the outside, I have no idea. But no, how is that a good thing where your top contenders who are going to have a really great scrap being all taken out and leaving one guy to go and pick up the spoils? How is that a good thing? No, I agree. Depends to... who you support. Yeah, true. Well, I agree with you to a certain extent, Chris. It ruined kind of the ongoing spectacle. But in all likelihood, your amazing five car scrap would have turned into a procession with three or four second gaps. Yeah, well, it would have should have been, and I'm just going to make this point now, it should have been a three-car scrap because I'll be honest, I think Ricardo had the better of the Mercedes in the dry, but you're overlooking the fact that his gearbox started losing oil pressure 30 minutes into the race, and somehow he managed to keep it going for the next 90 minutes and not lose a place to Botas or anyone else and, and, and stay relatively close to Hamilton, which was its own spectacular thing. We are I'm talking about control. the start. Guys, guys, we are talking about the start, though, before we move on to how the race was won and lost. You'll get your moment. Uh, Jeansy, we're still blaming people, and then I'm going to tell you who I think was to blame. The thing is about this whole start situation is, what was Seb doing anyway? 
Why on earth would you go ultra defensive on Max Verstappen when your nearest title competitor is four places back? Let Max go. Even if um, Kimi gets you, you're going to get put back in front of him anyway. So your worst case scenario is you're going to be second. And uh, Max has been erratic in these situations anyway. So would he be able to handle the pressure? We don't know, but it's it's Seb's fault because he did something that was entirely unnecessary. And as far as I'm concerned, there should be a penalty for it because it was avoid it was um, uh, causing an avoidable collision. No, see, this is where I disagree because yeah, I, there's a call from the stewards to put it down as a racing incident, i.e., hand out no penalty. I think that was right because, frankly, the two Ferraris got their just desserts in retiring from the race. I'll give you I'll give you it on that one, but at the end of the day, it sets a precedent that you can slice across somebody at the start. You people are all mental. There's nothing Vettel did that was the least bit illegal or wrong, and we've certainly never seen Hamilton pull that kind of a maneuver on Rosberg, have we? No. What Vettel did was entirely within the normal range of what people do when no, they're racing, when they're at the no. front, and especially when they get not the greatest of starts. Absolutely not. Right. Firstly, I'm going to correct all of you in one foul swoop, I think, before we go to the chat room. Chris, saying they've been punished enough is a ridiculous way to go about deciding whether you should get a penalty or not, because you can't you can't just go for what consequence. You've got to punish the action. What if Max Verstappen had been Lewis Hamilton instead of Max Verstappen and Vettel had gone over there, the Ferraris had squeezed him out and all three of those guys had run off in that situation because it's affecting the championship, you then give them a penalty? I don't think, no. I don't think that's right. No, they, w- they wouldn't have given out a penalty in that scenario either. Well, that's just wrong because what Vettel did was crazy. He started off I'm- on the far right-hand side of the track. He travelled pretty much the entire width of the track across to block off Max Verstappen. You cannot, it is completely unreasonable to drive closer to the edge of the track than there are cars to that side of you. If there's two cars to the left-hand side of you, you cannot then drive so there's only one and a half cars width uh, to the wall, which is exactly what happened. You cannot expect cars to disappear. Seb has pulled this move time and time again. Last year in Spa, he did it on his own teammate again. I think it was Max Verstappen again on turn one uh, in, in in Belgium. And he gave uh, Raikkonen absolutely nowhere to go. This time, he's tried to make that manoeuvre. And do you know what? He's not even waited till the corner. He's done it fully on the straight. You cannot fully on a straight just pile in over the side and expect everyone to jump out of the way and bless Verstappen he nearly did jump out of the way but Raikkonen if you look at the onboards was steering to the right what on earth was Raikkonen doing steering to the right the Ferrari boys have absolutely yeah. dropped it it's a disaster no, from from I'll give you Raikkonen I will give you Raikkonen 100 percent but Vettel when he made that move over to the left hand side was unaware that Raikkonen had such a belter of a getaway. And what Matt says is absolutely right. Vettel did nothing illegal, but it was the cause of the incident. You cannot just move over to the left-hand side with your competitor at the start and just assume there's no car uh, on the left-hand side of, of Max. That's insane. And Vettel never touched Verstappen. Let's be clear about this. And Verstappen never hit Vettel. They never made contact. So here it is. Audience, I'm calling on you right now. Tweet to spanners all you like, gifs or gifs of Hamilton making the same move on Rosberg, because I saw it at least a dozen times over the last two seasons. It's a normal thing that people do at the start. Sometimes he would even line up pointing the other direction. So so, so hang on, you can drive in front of someone, that's fine, but he was not in front of Max Verstappen. Verstappen was alongside. The rule is one one car width, and he left more than that because there were two cars there, mostly. <laughs> the and I'll tell you, if you move. want to blame somebody for poor driving, it's going to be Raikkonen because it looked like Raikkonen thought he was all the way past Verstappen, and he wasn't. But the fact of the matter is, I want to blame Raikkonen because he had no business being that good at the start of a race that was that important. It's like, you know, I play music, and you play with somebody, you you know what to expect. You know what they do. And here Raikkonen is, you know what he does. He gets a poor start. He has to make up places. He complains on the radio some and makes us all laugh. And suddenly there he is looking like it's P1 if he hadn't touched Verstappen's wheel. All right, let's see what the chat room is making with this. Uh, vote one for Spanners after calling 0800 985. Uh, I didn't think there was going to be an argument this week, to be honest. Uh, so uh, well done, panel, for bringing a discussion into it. What did the chat room make of it? 
very little argument in the chat room. It's entirely Ferrari's fault, whether you blame Kimi or you blame Seb. Um, Max was an innocent party. What we do have, and this isn't McLaren bias, but for a few milliseconds, as Evangelos points out, Alonso was third. Uh, and then there's been a hashtag started, which has been supported by uh, Mr. Byrne and also Hannah. Uh, hashtag justice for Fernando. As pointed out on my Twitter um, a minute ago, that's the reason it buzzed. Um, it's really, really easy to get a decent launch when you've got less power, so you've got less wheel spin. And re Alonso third, let's face it, for a while, Palmer was actually second in the race. I'd say that was even more of a miracle. I guess, uh, I guess we've decided, have we, whose fault it is? Vettel's, 100%. But we're all agreed that it's not Max's fault, though, right? Right. So I just, forensically speaking, want to make the point because I missed it. I missed it myself the first time through. The actual thing that happened was Kimi hit Verstappen, went on to hit Vettel, went on to hit Verstappen again, and then picked up Alonso as well. That's actually what happened. Yeah, and there were some people kind of blaming Max, but there was really nowhere for him to go. So I think if you are going to blame Max, you have to say that any time you are in the middle of two cars and that gap closes, you, you have to jump out of the way. And that picture that Alex is showing me that's been posted on Twitter, I think it's a bit useless, I think, when we do screen grabs of wherever cars are at certain points, because we don't know how long Verstappen's been on the brakes there. He could have seen that coming and been on the brake. But everybody's kind of looking at that and perhaps saying, well, he was behind. Uh, I think he did see that the gap was closing and he did put, put the brakes on. But I don't think it's reasonable. I really do not think it's reasonable at all uh, what Vettel did. And he's, he's done it before. This time it's penalized him and it's penalized only him. He could have let that go and he'd have still scored big points today. Could even have won the race. Instead, he's 28 points down in the championship. <laughs> Slightly delayed, Matt, but please, why don't you tell us where the race was won and lost? And I think we're going to kind of split it into two. Yes, the race was lost by a lot of people right at the beginning. After that, we settle into Vettel up front briefly before skidding on his own coolant. So what we had was Lewis Hamilton unexpectedly up front. He must have felt like he had a vanilla sky moment, you know, where Tom Cruise has been spliced back into where his life went wrong and everything made into his perfect scenario. Both Ferraris out, him up in up ahead uh, with what turned out to be an ailing Red Bull behind him. Where where was the race from there won and lost? Uh, well, you're taking away my fun because I personally would have loved to have had a camera pointed at Lewis's eyeballs. When he saw yes. Vettel <laughs> light it up into the wall and rip his entire nose off after all the carnage that had just happened and realize, oh, wow, I'm winning. I'm winning by a lot because there's no way Vettel's finishing now. In fact, the only other thing I would have liked more than that was to have heard Ricciardo's inner dialogue. Oh, terrible start. Oh, no. Oh, no. Got to get for snap. What? 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 Hey, I'm in second. Awesome. That would have been fantastic. But yeah, you're right. Things settled down. Um, and the important thing for me to note was that of the starters, uh, in particular, Signs had a very poor start. He was back in P10. And it was pretty much there wasn't a lot of action until we got the next safety car. And that's where the race got very interesting and tense for everybody. And if I'm remembering correctly, that was when Kvyat decided that it was worth it to overtake for two seconds and put it in the barriers rather than wait until he could just get the job done properly. Is it just me, but when someone goes into the barriers and causes a safety car at Singapore, you quickly scroll down to see how their teammate's doing? <laughs> Is that cynical? <laughs> but I mean, because science did end up P4. Uh, Chris, if you were lining up at that start of that race, would you have gone for wets or inters? It was quite surprising to see the field split like that. Personally, from where I was, it didn't look to be a good gamble to go onto the wets. But what do I know? No, I I, uh, I was surprised to see such a division. Um, I mean, the extreme wet tire is usually reserved for conditions where there is standing water. And uh, it certainly did not look like it. But at um, the same time, they didn't really have a chance to to go and look at the track. They'd done their... Uh, exploration uh, lap by the time they made it to uh, the grid and had to choose their tires which is when the rain started coming down 
So, uh, th yeah, they had to just take a, a little bit of a gamble. And with it being the very first wet race around Singapore, I can understand why some people wouldn't want to take a risk on an inter tire. But for me, uh, this, this, the decision to start on the extreme wet did, didn't make sense to me. But then everyone had a chance to correct it, Matt, at the safety car. And oh, Hamilton got very, very salty. And he didn't get his usual kind of mardiness. It was quite a sharp criticism uh, of his team because he didn't get new inters, but Ricciardo did. And he's sitting there not understanding why he didn't get his fresh set of boots. And then afterwards, he's going, yeah, Ricciardo looks quite fast on those lovely, fresh, intermediate tyres. Uh, but obviously, you know, Mercedes are have more information you know why didn't he get his new set of inters uh two words track position basically due to the fact that he was leading had he gone into the pits ricciardo would have stayed out on his set of enters and then been in the lead of the race and quite possibly kept it for the entire rest of the race this was mercedes point that they and they said it and they were right look whatever you did ricciardo was going to do the opposite but strategically, what that meant was that if the rain and wet track went on too long, Lewis was going to lose a big chunk of time having to make a pit stop under green flag conditions. Well, there was a little bit of questioning uh, of uh, whether some people were right to start on full wets. Um, Baja points out that wets were a quick uh, warm up more quickly and reduce the chances of crashing. But all the front runners started on inters. Um, then we had uh, sand maybe a little bit forward in the race, but Ericsson crashed, managed to crash on the bridge where no one had ever crashed before. And nice one. managed to do that. Nice one, Ericsson. I was just sat there just going, nice one, mate. You are a spectacular uh, contributor to the Formula One environment. Thanks. Right. So, you know, the full wets thing, you can see it's a gamble one way or the other, whether or not the rain comes or the rain doesn't come. And also it might have to do with just the basic uh, characteristics of your car. They might just suit one versus the other. But what was interesting about those pit stops as well is, is my boy Signs also stayed out. And by time that set of pit stops was done, it ultimately put him in position to nab his uh, P4 at the end of the race. He made up a lot of places by copying Hamilton's strategy and, and making up a lot of ground while everybody else came in to put on new enters, expecting the rain to go on and on. And in a way, it was kind of like Monaco with Ricciardo and Hamilton, where Hamilton stayed out on the really old tires till the switch over to dries came, and Ricciardo got on the new tires but just couldn't quite get by him, except for there was not so much of that couldn't quite get by him here at Singapore. Yeah, so talking of you know where the race was then ultimately won and lost then, Ricciardo had one more chance, and that was to do better on the changeover to slicks. Indeed, and we saw, I think, Magnussen go first around lap 25, and once he got them up to temperature, he started looking pretty racy. So the, the move for Red Bull at that point was to try and try the undercut and hope that they could make more time up on the dry tire before Lewis could get back around and, and, and answer them. However, as it turned out, that failed on two points. Point number one was, even with the pit stop, they came out behind Julian Palmer, who was, yes, in second place. Yeah, I, just, I will never get tired of saying that. I will be honest. It'll be the only time I ever say it, but I will never get tired of saying it. And then the second was is that he was not faster on, on the dry tire. In fact, Lewis, I think, took two full seconds out of him on his way round for, for his set of um, ultra sauce. Exactly. And Jeansy, whilst they were waiting to come off the inters onto slicks, which, by the way, took a long, long time, I thought in that heat, the track would dry up a lot quicker, but we were all sitting messaging each other going, when they go to slicks, Hamilton might be in a bit of trouble because we're going to see that Friday race pace. Back to what Matt was just talking about with regards to um, <clears throat> uh, why the guys coming out on softs weren't so quick when they came out of the pits. It's because the pit lane was soaking wet. So it took them, the, the tyres would have dropped straight down to no temperature at all and it would take them time to get the tires back up to temperature that's why lewis got that gap and actually i think he came back out 8.5 seconds ahead anyway um but that'll be the reason that they struggled to get the get them going once they go in they were quick because even um magnuson was was flying and of the fact that we thought that as soon as they went onto the slicks we were going to get a red bull charge 
Yeah, but unfortunately, it turns out because of Danny Rick's gearbox, that didn't come, which is a shame. Yeah, and here's a here's a good one. Uh, uh, While well, we're talking about Magnuson, who was the first one to gamble onto Slicks, Chris, he had a real fighty, punchy race. And though you know, ultimately, he didn't he didn't finish. Uh, and some people were criticising him for being a little bit too pushy. No one criticised Senna for being too pushy. You know, let's let Eric, let's let Magnuson be that guy. Let's let Magnuson be aggressive without criticising him. He's fighting for his F1, you know, life. And he's trying to show everyone that he is the guy that McLaren saw so much faith in. Oh, people did definitely complain about Senna, let me tell you. But um, no, I really enjoyed watching uh, Magnuson. Um, this weekend, I mean, the move on Felipe uh, down Raffles Boulevard was sheer braveness, in my opinion. Um, and yeah, just really elbows out. And, and that's good. And it's exactly the kind of thing uh, that we should have been seeing from him sort of a while ago. And I can I can see why Haas um, want to keep him next year, because does it really uh, seem like uh, the likes of Leclerc and Giovinazzi would just come in and beat him right away? I don't think so. I think he's got more to offer. Let's remember he's still a young man. And, and if he if he can just develop just that little bit more, I think Magnussen's going to be a feature in Formula One. Matt, the last real bit of racing we had was Mercedes telling Lewis Hamilton to keep the field tight, to deny them a free pit stop. Uh, presumably, if further uh, safety cars came in, you know, if they got stuck in that same situation where... Uh, Ric- Ricciardo would do the opposite uh, but it seemed like just you know being a bit too smart by half indeed and and the safety car you're referencing is is the one that made two different broadcasts say exactly the same thing which is I've never seen that happen there before and we can thank your boy Marcus Erickson yeah for creatively parking his car at the end of the bridge and barely leaving room for a single car to get by it was almost long beach like in it in its placement um and yeah, and that was interesting because, boy, Lewis was not a happy camper about that safety car crushing the margin that he'd worked to drag out over over Ricciardo. He wasn't yeah. at all. He didn't have a leg to stand on. There was a car facing backwards in a very narrow piece of track, although Bradley Philpott was messaging in the podcast group just going, just make him go around it. If they're any good, just make him go around it. It's bright and blue. You know, how hard can it be? <laughs> What's the chat room up to there, Darren? Chat room's uh, talking about the fantasy league. They've, they've sort of wandered down that a little bit. Um, the Evangelos, I have to point out, says that uh, Renault asked Hulkenberg to pit after the second safety car, but Hulk didn't want to spoil his no podiums record, which is the longest ever now, I think. Um, so Corky's complaining about uh, K. Mag- Kevin Magnussen needing to sort out his fruity language. And Baha says, Hamilton is great at all, in all conditions. Goat status. Greatest of all time. Well, the questions will be being asked, mainly by me and the rest of the Hamfosi. Uh, just having a look in the chat room for the first time today, Dominic Byrne saying, uh, in reference to KMAG, mugging a pensioner isn't that brave, in reference to his move on Massa. Tell you what, Massa really, really squeezed him. And there was some criticism, because I think this is one of the Sector 1 turns I think it is actually defined as a turn, even though it's flat out and it's pretty straight. Massa squeezed him all the way over to put him off, but I think he did leave a card's width in the end. It was a very aggressive defence from from Massa on a on a move that you had to say was pretty much done. That was um, Barrichello, Michael Schumacher, Hungary style. But um, that was tasty. I mean, to be fair, that whole battle between um, the Williams, the Haas, and was it the Force India? was yeah. oh, oh. epic what a brilliant, really good brilliant battle i was so pleased to see all of them so close daring moves and no contact no contact just enough room bit of squeezing going on proper elbows out I, that was that's the kind of racing i love that was brilliant as far as i'm concerned best bit of racing all season it was good matt that, that i think is pretty much where the race was won and lost but i do want to ask you three Guys, uh, some questions, some hypothetical questions, uh, mainly around, you know, this race pace and Mercedes. Why were they so competitive when it it seemed like they were going to be nowhere all weekend? I've got three main questions. Would Hamilton have beaten Ricciardo had Ricciardo got in front? Would he have held off a Ferrari if there was a Ferrari still in the race? And where was that pace in practice? But first, 
a word from our podcast partners. I interrupt the podcast this week to talk to you about Apex Race Manager, and it's a mobile app, and it's an exciting and challenging Formula One race strategy game. You don't drive the car. You make decisions about pitting, mid-race, tyre choice, driver aggression, uh, balancing out fuel use versus uh, how your driver goes about it, and and then you get resulting lap times. You choose your race strategy, you optimise your car, and you race to win the championship. And I'm smiling as I say it because... Uh, this game got me every bit as worked up as old school football manager. I think the the latest football manager games I've played have been a bit too intricate for me. Uh, but all the way back in the 90s, when you used to sit and watch little balls popping around uh, the screen and suddenly be told your man has scored, your man is injured, and you had to make quick decisions on what to do in the race. This is very much like that for me. And I definitely played this game a couple of weeks ago. And I played it like solidly for two weeks for all my coffee breaks because you can pick up a race a race is done within five minutes you don't just do the choosing the strategy that i read out in their little blurb there they've also got little mini games so it'll come to you'll come up to back markers and it'll give you a mini game where you have to you know use the phone screen to steer your car round back markers or make the perfect line through uh, an apex And and i'll tell you what one more one more little plug for this game is they've got the freemium model right it's a free download, but this is basically a four-pound game. Uh, what you do is you you download it for free. They give you a full season to try it out. And if you want to then continue that, you can obviously do another season again, but from the beginning. If you want to keep your stats and your character, you pay four quid for the pro version. And I, I think that's premium done right. The, the full game is four quid, and it won't cost you any more than that. Uh, we're going to give away some of the codes for that four-pound version. Uh, so some people have already won it and I'm going to be getting in contact with them soon. Go to hashtag Mist Apex Manager and tell me who is your least favourite person on the Mist Apex panel. Matt, vote for Matt. He's been getting too much praise for Trumpet's time. Yes, I, I they, people actually commented on Reddit. Go figure. Who knew? Absolutely. So that is Apex Race Manager for iOS and Android. All right then, Chris. Would Hamilton have beaten Ricciardo had he got ahead? Would he have held off a Ferrari challenge today? Where was that pace in practice? The first two questions are pretty much impossible to answer. All right, well, that's the end of the Uh, show then. See you later, guys. (laughs) And this has been Missed Apex Podcast. It's not how podcasting works, Chris. We just speculate wildly. The first two... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I I don't know if, if if Daniel would have been able to stay ahead. Certainly, if he didn't have his gearbox um, issue, I think it certainly would have been uh, closer. Had he gone ahead, it would have made li- uh, Lewis's life very difficult. I think Ferrari would have challenged today. I uh, uh, they had the pace to do so in, in in my opinion where was that pace on friday i think that pace on that we saw on friday from mercedes was pretty uh, uh, genuine they were uh, struggling as were you know a few teams it seemed because because it's, their car just isn't designed for this sort of track it's a unique gem on the calendar and that mercedes car has been designed to work on a variety of different circuits but not Singapore. I mean, we keep going back to the wheelbase thing. That longer wheelbase just doesn't work. It's like we saw in in Monaco, for example. And I, I, Lewis, you can't you can't get around the fact that Lewis was helped today by Verstappen, Vettel, Raikkonen, not getting twenty five seconds into the Grand Prix, and Ricardo having a gearbox issue. Not saying he still wouldn't have won the race, and he doesn't deserve any less praise for it. Because God forbid you lot should bombard me with tweets from this, but. Hashtag 44. <laughs> but you can't deny it. It's, it's a factor. You can't deny it. Oh, yeah. No, this was so jammy. And thing is, though, yeah, luck is part of Formula One. Lewis Hamilton's had some bad luck. And, and I'll stand by it. If Lewis Hamilton had stood there and say, said today, yeah, I bossed it. This, you know, I would have criticized him in the same way that I criticized Rosberg celebrating in Monaco 2015 when he got handed that victory and he looked like he'd won the World Cup. I'm like, dude, no. In snooker, if you fluke the black, like in off the cushion, you rock up to the cushion, you tap the, the side of the table and you nod at your opponent. You just you just acknowledge the luck a little bit. And I think it's absolutely fine. He drove a blinder of a race. But boy, 
boy, did the fates open up for him, Matt. Oh, yeah, they did. And and it's startling to me, uh, for being a journalist, how poor Stevens is at listening to directions. Because the questions were clear enough. He's terrible. Absolutely. He's a terrible person. Absolutely. Give Ricciardo the drive. I ask the questions. I don't answer them. Yeah, you don't listen to the answers either, apparently. But I digress. If you gave Ricciardo a healthy gearbox and a dry track and put him in front of, in front of Hamilton in this race, Lewis would not have gotten by him. That's what I say. Now, what was his second question? Same thing. Would the Ferraris have been able to get by him? That's a trickier question. I'm not convinced they would have just because he is such a good defensive driver, but they would have had, they would have been able to had he made a mistake in the turns because I feel like they were definitely better through the, through the turns and they would have been able to set themselves up, but they wouldn't, it would have been like a DRS kind of thing. And there was a third question or no. Well, just where was it in in uh, practice? But I'll, I'll answer that question myself, which is uh, genuinely, I think my answer to those questions is no. A, a healthy... Oh, hello. I've not heard that sound in 15 years. Someone using a dial-up. <laughs> has, has someone teleported us back to the <laughs> 90s? <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll say... Um, no, Hamilton did not have the, the pace. Initially, I was thinking, well, if he's got that much pace over Ricciardo, then that means the you know, the practice race pace stuff was, you know, a little bit out of the window and he would have definitely beaten Ferrari as well. But finding out that Ricciardo had a bit of a problem, it, that changes all that. And I think it was just a perfect storm. There were no Ferraris and there was a crippled Red Bull to race against. No, Mercedes probably didn't have the pace today. So if... As far as I'm concerned on that whole situation, if the two Ferraris hadn't hit Max and they'd gone into turn one without any incident, you'd have had probably Kimi in the lead, Max second, Seb third, Lewis fourth, because Lewis went straight round Ricardo off the start. You then would have had Max attacking Kimi with everything for its worth, and you would have had Kimi as a bottleneck. So it actually would have been really close between like the top six, seven, because I don't think Kimi would have gone anywhere. Um, you'd have had Max doing everything he could and probably would have crashed. I actually had I actually had Max as the first person to go out. And annoyingly, they classified him as the second to go out. So I lose out on my um, on my prediction. Who was first? Yeah. Kimi? Kim, they put Kimi uh, as first to go yeah, out. Yeah, no, that's Because technically, technically from the first hit, he was already out yeah. before he actually took Max out. Um, Lewis is great in those conditions. And... Before the race, one of my friends asked me, who does these conditions favour? And I said, Lewis, Max and Seb in that order. So That's I fair. think you'd eventually sort of seen um, Seb, not Seb, you'd eventually seen Kimi slip away behind those three. And it would have been, a, I think, a titanic battle between the three of those. Um, but I think the main reason that Lewis was much quicker than um the practice pace with Dean was because he was just much more comfortable in those conditions it wasn't as warm it was still wet offline all those different sorts of things and I think he just had more confidence and the ability to get it around the circuit without worrying about about missing a breaking point and doing all that kind of stuff you're on lakes boy how are you enjoying being shed head today it it is diabolically fast and uh and there's a lot going on there's a lot of tangents but one thing that just to back up what Alex has just said, the chat has uh, has wondered whether Hamilton would have done any good if he was blocked up behind the Ferraris, if he if he was fifth or fourth after the first corner, because that Mercedes isn't too good at uh, following. Uh, and they'd already they pointed out as well that the temp the change in temperature really suited him. Yep, yep, exactly. Uh, it was it was perfect. Every single condition worked out for Lewis Hamilton today. Every single box was was ticked cooler ferraris out red bulls crippled one red bull out uh rain for hamilton all the boxes were ticked well he kind of it was almost biblical you know then that he got everything lined up for him and even the red seas parted was the ferraris <laughs> disappeared off the track cool thank you very much yeah i i think the mercedes has a little bit harder time with its tires the way it sets up and in, on tracks like this where you're using a lot of the tire it's very, very bad for them. The fact that it was around 30 C instead of 40 or 50 C, which which it can get pretty hot in Singapore, definitely helped them out. And if you were wondering, were there any external indicators of how Mercedes rated their chances? Well, 
uh, according to Ted on Sky, apparently they were running the second power unit in today's race. That would no. be the one that they started using back in April. So I'm going to go with they really didn't. They were just going to try and limit the damage today. And that's all they were looking to do. Absolutely. All right, then let's play a little game. This is Downforce Radio. But not before plugging our friends over at Downforce Radio, a network of motorsport podcasts run by Jake Sanson, who frequently appears on here. Look out for his Wednesday night shows, uh, Pit Board, where he attempts to create a motorsport version of Mock the Week, or Have I Got News for You. Uh, they are a bunch of motorsport nerds with a capital N, and it's a two-hour fest of indulgent motorsport ramblings well worth taking out and keep your eye on downforce radio because big things are happening for them so let's play a game matt no not global thermonuclear war let's call this game palmer or massa or claire williams and the mystery of the 2018 empty seat because massa's not really doing it for me right now he's even slipping behind stroll all right professor falcon we can play that game Ancient movie reference activated. Only you and me old enough to get it. Indeed. Um, no, it, 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 it's one of those things where you're sitting there watching Palmer finished in six and you're thinking about the amount of money that he has and you're thinking about the fact that Williams is basically nowhere anyway. And you're looking at Massa. I mean, granted, they, they gave him bad strategy and left him out on the wet too long. But, you know, still, really? I mean, really? And you're like, well, I don't know. Maybe it's a cushy life. And you get a British person in there. They bring a lot of money. Doesn't matter if they make so much in the point. And oddly enough, in a halfway decent car in the right setting, Palmer can come home in P6 and not wreck things. I mean, he actually made some nice overtakes. He demonstrated some skills that you might expect people at this level to actually have. So I don't know. Maybe. Maybe Palmer's dad is going to go be banging on Claire Williams' door. I don't know. I'm just going to say it's getting more and more interesting what's going to happen with that second Williams seat next year. I feel that if Palmer does stay in the sport, his inability to be competitive until two-thirds of the way through the season is going to hamper him long term. Uh, but Chris, do you fancy Palmer for that seat? I genuinely have no idea anymore. I, I, honestly, it's getting to that point where I just don't know what to think. I think it I, it would... I would be surprised if that were to happen. Um, but I think Williams are running out of options. The chances are they probably will just retain uh, Felipe. Uh, he, we already know he's not doing Formula E next oh, season. God no. So he, 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 chances are he probably will stick around. Well, apparently, uh, Kubitz has been testing the Williams simulator. But we don't know what his proper limitations are yet. Like... He did race distances. Just the, it's the, it's the fairy double. tale the sport needs. Could you imagine how... Um, uh, Liberty would absolutely plug the life out of that. It would be a great story for Formula One, and better than putting Palmer in just because he's got some money. Yeah, but they're not going to do. They're not going to just put Kubica in the car because it's a great story. As much as I would, you know, love that. I'm mean, sure we'd all love to see it. You can't just put Kubica in because you know because of that. It, it, you you've got to justify that, and we really don't know what Kubica's. Uh, limitations or even you know ability is in a formula one car anymore can't do well, a workshop chris, in palmer chris we're going to find out who how good he is in a kibitza is in a williams next week because according to our friend anil in the chat room uh he is testing a williams next week as he is stroll he is indeed i don't um have much more information on that other than he is driving the car so we'll find out well there's a hype train on its way and it's got kibitza's name all over it all right, guys, let's move on to the podium. No booing this week, but we were, we were saddled with Eddie Jordan. It's not my favourite podium interview when I see him saddle up. Always feels horribly, horribly awkward, Chris. Yeah, I was going to give my missed apex to whoever allowed him onto the podium. Um, it's proper bad, and you can tell people don't want him there as well. It's tough when, you know, especially, I, I know I'm alone in this, but I was disappointed after that race because we were denied a good scrap. And then to find out that he was doing the podium. Oh. I pay for Sky, so I don't have to listen to Eddie Jordan. 
All right, then, let's go on to Thing of the Weekend and chat room. Get your Things of the Weekend into Darren here whilst the boys answer. Matt, who was your Thing of the Weekend? Had to be Danny Ricciardo, not for bringing home that Red Bull with the ailing gearbox, but for his quote. When Re- he learned of Renault's interest in him, why not? I'm fast and I'm good looking. That was clearly the thing of the week as far as I was concerned. My thing of the week was to the aggressive and punchy Kevin Magnussen. Let's see him roll on from here. And since I know Jeans, he's just given me the look that that was the one he wanted to do. Let's go straight to him. So he has no time to think of another one. It's all right. I've got another one. It's fine. Um, and I'm going full ham focus this weekend. And it's Lewis, but mostly for his gate crashing of Sebastian Vettel's interview on the parade lap. It was it was hilarious. I just found it really funny. And all these people that say he's not likable, it's rubbish because you do stuff like that. And it's funny. Danny Rick would do it and they'd all love him for it. Yeah, that's true. But on race performance, I, I am struggling to justify giving it to Lewis Hamilton and the Mercedes team. They were there. They were in the fight. But they were not the best team driver combination, Matt. No, and you could always give it to Vettel's pole lap if you felt like making Hannah Hassel happy. Oh, thanks very much, Matt. Well, you could give it to him then. That's fine with me. I was going to give it, but none of you have said Carlos Sainz, which is astonishing. Why? He was gifted it by his teammate being ordered into the barrier. His teammate was ordered into the barrier just so that he could time it exactly right to come in. No, of course not. He Uh, Nelson PK'd it. (laughs) There's no suspicion of that whatsoever, of course. But Chris, who would you give your thing of the weekend? I was going to give it to the pole lap. Yeah, well. Give it to Carlos now, since none of you have said it. Carlos signs. All right, then. Uh, Lakes boy. Yep. So Matthew Graff, thing of the weekend. Alonso. Uh, the gif of Alonso's launch set against Elton John's Rocket Man, and, and Alonso himself tweeted out a picture with Singapore Airways uh, in the background as he was being launched into midair. And I would like to hear Matt's version of uh, Danny Rick's start, but with Fernando Alonso as well. Yes, this is fantastic. Finally, I'm returning to the front of the grid. Done. All right. Who else are they saying? Dominic Byrne is back in. His thing of the weekend is for er- Ericsson's for his excellence in crashing. Waste and of time. Joshua Clare says that the Singaporean clouds were his thing of the weekend. Thank you, Ericsson weather. Did, Ericsson did try and end up in the sea because he did crash at the bridge. Yes, but he needs to be fully submerged to release his full potential. Uh, ooh, let's go on to the bad thing. Oh, no, you missed the apex. Mr. Trumpets, who missed the apex for you? Well, of course, it had to be Marcus Erickson. Boy, did he ever miss it. Backwards across the bridge, getting called out on two major networks for parking a car where it had never been parked before. It's just, yeah, yeah. Marcus mm. Erickson. I think, I think I've made a decision. I'm never going to talk about Marcus Erickson again. You guys can mention him. That's fine. I I am just, I am never going to mention his name or talk about anything he does ever again. Jeansy, who missed the apex for you? Um, It's Ferrari's post-race. Apart from the interviews that the two drivers have to have, they didn't talk to a single TV company. And I think that's terrible. Doesn't matter whether you have a good race or a bad race, you should always be talking to the press. And the fact that no one got any into explanation, um, everyone refused to talk to anybody. I just think it's really, really poor form. I think it's disgraceful from Ferrari. Aren't they contracted to do so? That was my thought. Chris, you'd know more about that. So before you give us your Miss Apex Award, uh, aren't they contracted to do that? Uh, I uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm sure they are uh, obliged to to do so, but um, I, you know, you know, Ferrari. Uh, can get away with sometimes. Um, for my missed apex, yes, uh, I should be giving that to Renault, who uh, day late and a dollar short on the strategy yep. and pneumatic leak costing Hulkenberg a P4 finish. That is, did did Hulkenberg accidentally rub brush past Nick Heidfeld as he was retiring on his way out, and Nick just passed his luck onto him? Because Matt. That... <laughs> He gave him his black cat, that's what it was, and uh, his ladder and uh, spilt his salt. Because he, he was running comfortably in third place. And I think I tweeted out like, huh, I wonder how he'll find a way to throw away this podium. And it wasn't him on this occasion. First, yeah, Renault took it away from him by, by pitting very late. And then a mechanical issue stopped him fighting anyway. But he's now a record holder. 
He is the longest standing driver to have had more races than anybody else and not have a podium. Amazing. Well done. And and I'm sure Alonso is looking forward to the improved reliability of that Renault as we speak. Absolutely. What's the chat room saying? Has missed the apex, uh, Darren? <sighs> Ericsson, clearly. Yeah, um, obviously. Yeah, with uh, the Ferrari missed the apex. They didn't even get to it. It's true. Uh, we've got another hashtag going, which is uh, free the McLaren 2 from Philip Allen. <laughs> uh, the missed apex award from Anvangelos's missed ape uh, is the Toro Rosso boys radio. Oh, yeah, they were getting very feisty. There was two radio messages in a row with just like simple information and they both did the, the leave me alone. And I think one time the the engineer's radio started off with battery temps and then the driver came in and went just leave me alone stop talking to me I'm like whoa dude that sounds important i'd listen Wasn't to that one, one of them magnuson mag it could have been magnuson i was like you should definitely listen to anything about temperature and batteries because they get explodey to be one fair more. is it sorry sorry what one more uh rob de Gunnell is uh the missed apex award goes to ferrari's twitter for tweeting out that it was not ferrari's fault and that's interesting. That was going to be my pony award, but certainly they did miss the apex. And we thought it was kind of like a a, a gut reaction, you know, an instant tweet uh, to go from their team and say, no, Max definitely took Kimi out and Kimi hit Vettel. Then they, they followed it up much later and they, they doubled down on it. And it was very much reminded me of the kind of way that public figures have been tweeting that kind of gives it away and just the way that you know kind of britain and american politicians have been doing this thing of just going right here is a truth and it doesn't matter how outrageous it is here is the truth here is what we are saying and we are just going to keep saying it and they'll just stick to it and stick to that party line no matter how insane it sounds and no matter how much people point out the obvious to them and they've kind of gone down that line and it it just it seems ridiculous they seem like a bunch of clowns frankly, from those two tweets. it's It was apparent in Seb's post-race interview, though. He was very quiet. He didn't say much. And after Baku, he was really aggressive and boisterous and all this kind of stuff. But this, it was it was almost like, oh, rubbish. I have really done wrong. It's I've screwed this up for myself. It was the look on his face and was enough admission of guilt as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> All right, then, Matt, here's my favourite. I'm sure you'll have one of these lined up. Daddy, I want a pony. And I want it now. Got a pony award for us, Matt? Yeah, I do. I'm going to go with the tried and true Romain Grosjean, who, when he realised it was raining apocalyptically at the start of the Porsche Super Cup, well before the start of the race, was already complaining that the drivers weren't going to be able to see anything because of the spray and the lights, and that there's no way they had any business racing in that weather. And for the record, I want to point out that, say what you will about the crash and turn number one, it had nothing to do with the track being wet. I think the poor lad was still suffering a little tremors from his experience in Monza and was already trying to work Charlie Whiting to make sure it didn't happen again. Jeansy, who has your pony award this week? Um, mine's got to go to Lewis for after the Ericsson safety car. Where it's like, oh, it's fine. It could just be dealt with under a virtual safety car. Please don't take my lead away again. <laughs> for the third time. <laughs> it, it was he, If you saw, he put his hands on top of the steering wheel and was like, oh, God, i got to do this again. Loved it. But did it, he did. And now he has a 28-point lead as we head very much into races that are Lewis Hamilton territory, Malaysia, Austin. Well, no, I I would just like to refute this because I'm a 28-point lead, it does sound formidable on the surface. But all it takes is, you know, one, one crash, one mechanical failure and for Seb to get a good result. And that, all of a sudden... Is, is turned back round on its head. Crash? Lewis doesn't crash. Don't be so ridiculous. No, of course he does. Never. <laughs> and of course, and I don't think anyone was suggesting that the championship is in any way over, uh, but I did state the actual fact that he has a 28-point lead and we are going to a series of races that Lewis Hamilton would very much back him on. And 
will suit the Mercedes car. You have to say the Ferrari guys are up against it and they have blown a golden opportunity to close up the gap in the championship. So guys, uh, thank you for joining us for this Singapore Grand Prix. If you haven't already listened to our back catalogue from last week, we had some incredible shows. Not only did we ch- chat to Joe Sayward um, on Inside F1, we also had Summers on, Matt's first independently produced Wafflecast podcast. We had the fantastic Jack Nichols from the BBC and from that other podcast, Checkered Flag, you know, with all the driver interviews and stuff. We could be that good if we had driver interviews. Uh, but he came on. He was really generous with his time and generous with his openness about his F1 commentating and career. We also had the brilliant Justin Robert Young, and I suggest you follow him on Twitter. He does some fantastic podcasts. If you get into Justin Robert Young and the Diamond Club, you will never run out of podcasts to listen to again. Uh, and then join us next week when we will be doing some news and possibly a quiz. Uh, Chris, we haven't caught up with you for a while. What are you up to at the moment? Uh, well, I've just done my last uh, Autosport magazine uh, appearance for the year, uh, covering the 750 Motor Club meeting at Rockingham. Uh, we do have the final meeting at Dunton at the end of the month, which we'll be covering, but I'll be going to. So you can follow on my Twitter if that's the sort of thing you're uh, interested in. Jeansy, what you doing, pal? I, I know you uh, you did a bit of racing in the Cov Cart. Yeah, I was at Cov Cart a couple of weeks ago um, over at Rye House. Actually, had a really really good weekend. Um, got fourth overall in the heavies and let, and won the heavy plus, which was great. And I'm racing again on Sunday at Lakeside, which I haven't been to in about eight years. So I'm really looking forward to that. So um, I, I'm I'm very very happy being finally back in the seat. I feel like me again. Just got to lose a few more pounds. Pretty rude calling it heavies, in my opinion. Trumpets. Where can people catch up with you? As always, you can look for me at MattPT55 on the Twitters. And, of course, my lovely darling wife at A Weaver Writes, also on the Twitters. Go buy her books, please. Darren, thanks for looking off to the chat room. Where can people catch you? At Wongo the Insane on Twitter or uh, at strawberry hash, stra- strawberry-cottage.co.uk if you want any landscaping done in the Northwest. Free plug. Well, we'll send you an invoice, see how it works out. But uh, since you're there, why don't you tell us who you are awarding? Coming half the week. Okay, I'll give you a couple of early ones. Hannah Hassel is fine now. She's a Ferrari fan. She's not angry, just disappointed. Uh, Corku Anoma is saying, Spanners, you're as smug as Jose Mourinho today. But my favourite, and it relates to the live stream because Chris doesn't have a camera, just a picture of himself tonight. Uh, and on the gas is if Chris Stevens put some clothes on, would he then turn on his camera? No, he's fully naked. Don't want his camera. So who are you awarding the prize to? Um, it's going to go to Evangelos, which is, he was saying Red Bull Honda will be a Ronda. Comment of the week. Also, if you're enjoying Missed Apex Podcast, please consider supporting us at patreon.com and searching Missed Apex Podcast. And until next week, why not follow me at Spanners Ready and the show at Missed Apex F1. And remember that wounds heal, chicks dig scars, and glory lasts forever. This was Missed Apex. I had my daughter doing a dance around going hooray <laughs> hooray for Lewis I've brainwashed them all oh come on I want an hour and 10 minutes but you've got to Corrupt give me them while they're young hilariously I do think Phoebe prefers Valtteri Bottas just because when we were in when we were in Tenerife we were watching F1 on a Spanish channel and every every so often they just went Valtteri Bottas so now whenever she hears his name, she just goes, that three when I was When I was in Montreal, there were these guys behind me. I have no idea who the hell they were. But any time Jose Maria Lopez did anything on the screen, and I literally mean anything, just go around a the corner, they'd go, oh, Pachito, 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 Pachito. And I wanted to turn around and just go, shut up. Who? Oh, in Formula E. Formula E. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that.
inferior series, right? Okay, yeah. The great <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Well, no, I mean, how many world championships I mean, you Nico won? Prost did well in it. That's how. No, no, he series. didn't. No, no, he doesn't. I just you've never even given it a chance. He does not do Actually, well. To be fair, the, the one race I remember with Nico Prost is when he crashed into Nick Heidfeld. But... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that that like, was the on. that was the first race. <laughs> that was the, the very first race, race that he did well. Oh, I, I'm going to drive a racing car, by the way. Oh God, okay. that shouldn't happen. I know. You struggled but... with the really low powered go kart. I beat you in a go kart, and I'm I... really not that good. I know, and yet a double stock hatch champion is going to give me his car for a week. Oh my god! Right, okay. Well, who is that? Who is that person? His name is Pip Hammond. You will oh, know him from yes, uh, Pip Pipboard. Okay, actually. everybody, find Pip Hammond on Twitter and tell him exactly why this is a terrible idea <laughs> and, and why I should be in the car, not him. Why not? Oh, what? Just because I'm slower than a, a short. Thin spanners because I'm fat. Mm, but you seem happy about this opportunity, and I want to take that happiness away from you. So everybody, get in touch with Pip Hammond. Say no. You know I'm going to do.